In 1966, a renowned scientist released a book with information that could have impacted everyone on Earth. But before anyone could read it, it was classified by the CIA. We only learned about this a few years ago when it was declassified. However, the CIA only released 57 pages of the original 284-page manuscript. And these pages, according to the CIA, underwent special processing. So why does the CIA believe this book is so dangerous that it had to be hidden from the public for 60 years? And why do they continue to hide most of it? Well, because the man who wrote it describes the end of the world. In 1966, Dr. Chen Thomas, a former engineer at McDonnell Douglas, released a book titled The Story of Adam and Eve. And while the title may sound like an ordinary story in reality, he speaks literally. This book is about the end of the world. Thomas presents evidence of an impending shift in Earth's poles causing a cataclysm. And Thomas claims that these pole shifts are cyclical, that at regular intervals, a catastrophe almost completely destroys human life. And we start over again in the Stone Age. He says that in fact, we are the sixth advanced civilization on Earth. There may have been more civilizations here on Earth. But the further back we go into the past, the harder it is to know for sure. Because some of these civilizations occupied continents that no longer exist. Thomas was not the first scientist to publish this theory. In 1958, nearly ten years before the story of Adam and Eve, Charles Hapgood released works on the displacement of the Earth's crust, discussing the hypothesis of crustal displacement. Now, of course, we know that Hapgood was right. Continents indeed move. They shift and collide over and over again, and this has been going on for nearly four billion years. Pangaea was a supercontinent that split apart, forming the current land masses. But before Pangaea, there was the supercontinent Gondwana, which existed for 400 million years. Before Gondwana, there were Panotia, and before it, Rodinia, Columbia, Atlantica, Arctica, Kenoland, Ur, and Valbara. All these were supercontinents that eventually broke apart and reformed. After collaborating with Einstein and several other scientists, Charles Hapgood released the book, The Path of the Pole, as an update to his previous theories. In this book, Hapgood suggested that the Earth's poles are constantly moving. Again, this pseudoscience was eventually confirmed. Hapgood believed that a pole shift of between 15 and 40 degrees occurred around 9600 BCE, or 11600 years ago. This was the time of the Younger Dryas. The Piri race map has puzzled scientists for centuries. On race's map, the continent Antarctica is depicted. But Antarctica was not discovered until 1820. And race claimed that the information on his map came from much older maps. If Charles Hapgood was right and the Earth's axis was shifted by 15 degrees from its current position, then Antarctica would not be completely covered in ice. Hapgood believed in an Ice Age civilization, long forgotten, that mapped the shores thousands of years ago. Although many of Hapgood's theories turned out to be true, the Ice Age pole shift still causes controversy. We know that the poles shift over time. We also know that continents drift over very long periods of time. But Dr. Chan Thomas, in his book The Story of Adam and Eve, says that the shift happens in less than one day. Chan Thomas describes in detail how this will be. And it's worse than any Hollywood disaster movie ever made. 
much worse. Chan Thomas begins his book with a chapter that precisely describes what we will experience during the event of a pole shift. With a rumble so low it can't be heard, turning into a thunderous roar, an earthquake begins. But this is not just any earthquake in history. The mountains of California shake like ferns in the wind. The mighty Pacific Ocean recedes, forming a mountain of seawater more than two miles high. Then it begins its movement eastward. The assault of the wind begins, tearing everything in its path with supersonic bombardments. The mountain of Pacific seawater follows the wind east, flooding Los Angeles and San Francisco as if they were mere grains of sand. The mighty wind, moving at a speed of thousands of miles per hour, mercilessly sows destruction everywhere. Why such a violent wind? The Earth rotates at about a thousand miles per hour. We don't feel it because everything rotates together. The Earth, water, atmosphere. But Thomas says that when a pole shift occurs, the air and water of the Earth continue to rotate, but the land stops. In many places, the scorching sublayer of the earth breaks through, spreading a sea of molten liquid lava. In a fraction of a day, all traces of civilization disappear. And cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Dallas, New York, Boston, become mere legends. Not a stone remains where millions of people walked just a few hours ago. Now imagine what would happen if you were riding in a car going a thousand miles per hour and suddenly it stopped. Imagine what would happen if a large city moving at a speed of a thousand miles per hour suddenly stopped. Skyscrapers would collapse. Millions of people would be scattered around as if they had gone through a meat grinder. Very few would survive, but the survivors are the unlucky ones because moving across the country at the speed of sound a wall of water, mud and debris two miles high approaches. At this moment, South America realizes that the Andes Mountains are not high enough to stop this catastrophe. In less than a day, the entire continent is engulfed in fire, molten earth, which, buried under miles of raging seas, then turns into a frozen hell. Everything freezes in less than four hours, man, beast, plant, everything. Thomas says that when a shift occurs, the earth stops moving and the sun stops moving in the sky. This means that one side of the earth becomes very hot and the other very cold. The temperature will drop by 180 degrees, which means that even in the warmest parts of the planet, the temperature will be 80 degrees below zero. Everything will freeze into stone ice within four hours. Europe cannot be saved. The Alps, the Pyrenees, the whirlwinds contract and then rise even higher when the flood hits with a wall of seawater. Western Africa and the sands of the Sahara disappear. The fury marches for six days. On the sixth day, the ocean begins to calm down. The Bay of Bengal Basin is now at the North Pole, directly east of India. At the South Pole, directly west of Peru, there is now the Pacific Ocean. New glaciers begin to form in the new polar regions. Greenland and Antarctica are now rotating equatorially, where green tropical plants appear. Thomas predicts a 90-degree turn of the Earth's axis. Essentially, this means turning the planet on its side. New York lies at the bottom of the Atlantic, covered in an incredible amount of mud. Nothing remains of San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Dallas and Boston. The cataclysm has done its work, bringing the pitiful survivors into a new Stone Age. We join Noah, Adam and Eve, Atlantis, Mu and Olympus, and Jesus joins Osiris, Aura, Zeus and Vishnu. In the first chapter of his book, Dr. Thomas describes a terrifying future. But how likely is it? In the following chapters, Thomas continues not only to prove the possibility of a shift, but also asserts that it has already happened and will soon repeat. 
In fact, there are signs that it may have already begun. But how likely is it? We usually associate great floods with the end of the last ice age, the Younger Dryas, and core samples provide reliable evidence that this happened. But interestingly, Thomas says that the last great flood was not 11,500 years ago, but 6,500 years ago. In the 1960s, there was very little information on this. But a few years ago, archaeologists discovered evidence of the Gunyu flood myth in China. Evidence of a great flood has been found in the Mediterranean and also in the Black Sea. These discoveries tell us that the flood took place between 6500 and 7000 years ago, in the recent past, more recently than the Younger Dryas. And that is precisely the time Thomas talks about. Chan Thomas provides dates for other floods. The Younger Dryas was approximately 11500 years ago. Before that there was a flood 18500 years ago. And that is precisely the period when the Beringia land bridge was flooded. Before that, there was a flood 29,000 years ago, which was the end of the Wisconsin glaciation. And before that, 43,800 years ago. But global floods do not cause doubt. We know they happened. What causes controversy is the claim that before each of the floods, there were advanced civilizations. Mainstream archaeology and paleontology say that the first civilization appeared in Mesopotamia 6,500 years ago. But what if that was just the last reboot? When we look at the erosion around the base of the Great Sphinx, we see patterns formed by the action of flowing water. Huge volumes of water moving at great speed. But if this is water erosion, it means that the Sphinx was created before the last flood, six, five hundred years ago before the emergence of Egyptian civilization. Archaeologists do not like this idea, and they do not like the idea that the Sphinx was built more than 10,000 years ago. But there are other pieces of evidence of a cataclysm, a pole shift, specifically the great flood of mud that caused the sinking of a continent. I mean Atlantis. Chan Thomas makes quite extreme claims in The Story of Adam and Eve. Incredible claims require incredible evidence. In his dialogues, Plato introduced the world to Atlantis, a utopian society destroyed by catastrophe. But until definitive evidence of Atlantis is found, it will continue to be considered a mythical land. But this should not stop people in their search. Chan Thomas presents some circumstantial evidence for the theory of cyclic cataclysm. But the main questions are how and when will it happen? Chan Thomas updated his predictions in 1993, saying that the shift would occur within seven years, around the year 2000. He mentioned that Nostradamus and Edgar Cayce made the same prediction, but that was more than 20 years ago. This means that there is a high probability that the shift will happen now, that we are already now in that very critical moment when it can happen. Well, let's consider a few points from this book and see how they relate to the science we know. Dr. Chan Thomas was a real person. Chen is a nickname. His full name was Dr. Chauncey Powers Thomas. He was born in Missouri in 1920 and passed away in 1998. He had a family, a wife, children and grandchildren. He indeed was an electrical engineer and worked for the company McDonnell Douglas. He even appeared as a UFO expert in a documentary in the 90s. And he was on the Johnny Carson show on April 7, 1965, along with Ava Gabor. Dr. Thomas wrote several books, including about the upcoming cataclysm. He wrote a lot about UFOs. So why did the CIA classify this book? It's somewhat of a mystery. What was classified was this book. A service note with a list of purchases for some tools and a car. As well as a clipping from People magazine. 
This document was in the possession of a service employee and was classified simply as a matter of course. In 1966, when the book was classified, Dr. Thomas was working at McDonnell Douglas on UFO technology and anti-gravity technology. He also worked as a design engineer at Bell Labs on missile guidance systems. The classified documents were probably part of a reference report or perhaps someone was monitoring him. You will hear that the book was banned. But that's not true. Only this book, specifically this copy, was classified. There were freely available copies in circulation. He also published sequels in 1971 and 1993 and none of them were classified. As for the content of the book itself, if we look, Thomas does not provide any compelling evidence. He makes many conclusions based on old documents. Some of them are quite bold. And it seems that he borrows ideas from others, from those who wrote about disasters, such as Hapgood, Emanuel Velikovsky and a few others. But he chooses his favorite parts without providing specifics. Now there are ice core samples from the eastern part of Antarctica that show it has been covered with ice for at least 1.5 million years. Indeed, the western side of the continent is a bit more complicated because there it may not always have been covered with ice. But in any case, we know for sure that the ice has been there for a long time. When Chen Thomas released an expanded version of the book in 1993, he made no corrections and provided no new evidence. However, in this version of the book, there were chapters on extrasensory perception, UFOs and angels. It seems that Thomas gathered many ideas he had over the years and then put them into one last book. So, two questions. Was Dr. Chen Thomas a serious researcher? There is no evidence that he was. Second, is there evidence to support some of his claims? There is. Some of the claims he makes in his book have turned out to be possible. We know that global floods have occurred. The evidence is everywhere. These floods, particularly from the younger Dryas, were not caused by oceans. They were the result of rapid glacial melting. Nevertheless, they were destructive. They really created tsunamis a thousand feet high. And indeed raised sea levels by hundreds of feet. He says the temperature drops so sharply and quickly that everything instantly freezes. He talks about mammoths that instantly froze with buttercups in their mouths. And it's true. Mammoths have been found instantly frozen while eating. Now, freezing a steak takes a long time. But what had to be the extremely extreme circumstances to instantly freeze a mammoth? According to Thomas, seismic activity is one of the reasons for the displacement of the Earth's axis. This is also true. NASA discovered that a strong earthquake in Indonesia in 2004 shifted the North Pole by about 25 centimeters to the east. The Earth's rotation accelerated, which shortened the length of the day by 2.7 microseconds. In 2010, an earthquake in Chile did the same thing. The Earth's axis shifted and the day became shorter again. The following year in Japan, it happened again. Earthquakes slightly accelerate the Earth, but the moon slows it down. Things remain quite well balanced. Shifts are not something to worry about or pay attention to. The shifting of the magnetic poles is a problem. We know that the Earth's poles change. North becomes south and vice versa. And from a geological point of view, this happens often. It has happened hundreds of times. On average, the time between shifts is about 300,000 years. But we haven't had a shift for almost 800,000 years. So we should have had a new shift a long time ago. So we are already very late. How do we know they have changed? When lava cools, it creates a record of the orientation of past magnetic fields. Similar to how a tape recorder records sound, 
the poles are always moving. In the early 1990s, the North Pole was shifting about nine miles a year, but this gradually increased. GPS navigation was periodically updated every five years to account for this, then every year, and now every six months. Now it drifts at a speed of almost 40 miles a year. The Earth's magnetic field is rapidly weakening. These are signs that a shift may occur. So is this the end of the world? Well, life will continue. Animals that navigate using geomagnetism will be confused. But within a generation or two, they will figure it out. Animals that do not use magnetism probably won't notice the changes. Geological records do not show major extinctions during pole shifts. And our species has already survived several shifts over the last three million years. And we are still here. But our ancestors did not have satellites, GPS navigation and airplanes. Many of our technologies will fail, but code can be rewritten and software can be fixed. The real danger lies in the period between shifts. As we approach a pole shift, the Earth's magnetic field weakens significantly. This makes us vulnerable to solar activity, solar winds, storms, coronal mass ejections. This is bad. Without a magnetic field, satellites will burn up if they are not protected. Cancer rates will skyrocket. And if you think climate change is a problem now, either way, the climate will become very unpredictable. But the biggest attack will be on our power grids. Too strong solar activity can knock out all electricity on Earth. For days or weeks, possibly even months in some places, to say that there will be civil unrest is a strong statement. When Dr. Chen Thomas released his book, The Story of Adam and Eve, it was marked as pseudoscience. But about 50 years since its publication, many of his claims can be proven. It seems to me that in some cases the difference between pseudoscience and real science is just a matter of time. And if at least part of Dr. Thomas's predictions come true, then our time is coming to an end. depths of space where stars are born and die, the Milky Way galaxy continues its eternal journey. Earth and the Sun, like two travelers faithful to their course, follow the great rotation of the galaxy, carrying with them the history and fate of billions of lives. Many know that the Earth revolves around the Sun, completing a full orbit in one year. But few consider that the Sun itself revolves around the Milky Way, requiring 225 to 250 million years to do so. The Milky Way is a planetary spiral cluster with a diameter of about 150,000 to 200,000 light years, containing from 150 to 400 billion stars and approximately 100 billion planets. 
Our solar system is located about 26,000 light years from the galactic center on the inner edge, which is called the Orion Arm. The stars forming the inner 10,000 light years from the center of the galaxy create a bulge that extends vertically both above and below the galactic plane. At the center of the Milky Way is an intense source of radio waves known as Sagittarius AR because it appears in the constellation of Sagittarius. It is also theoretically assumed that at the center of the Milky Way there is a supermassive black hole weighing 4.1 million solar masses. Stars such as our Sun revolve around the galactic center at approximately 220 kilometers per second which means that the Milky Way contains much more mass than it appears. Approximately 95% of the mass of the Milky Way is invisible, not emitting or absorbing electromagnetic radiation. This is the so-called dark matter, considering that the Earth is estimated to be 4.5543 billion years old. This means that it has orbited the Milky Way, along with the Sun, several times. Recently, NASA scientist Jesse Christiansen pointed out what was happening on Earth during our last rotation around the galaxy. Lately, at the same time in the galactic year, the Jurassic period. The last time we were in the same position around the galaxy as we are now, the Jurassic period was just beginning on Earth. It lasted about 56 million years starting at the end of the Triassic period, about 2.3 million years ago, and ending at the beginning of the Cretaceous period, about 145.5 million years ago. The Jurassic period is named after the Jura Mountains in the European Alps, where limestone layers of this period were first identified. During this period, the supercontinent Pangaea began to break up into two continents, Laurasia in the north and Gondwana in the south. Expanded coastlines changed the climate from dry to humid and numerous lush tropical forests were created. On land, dinosaurs came to their heyday and it is believed that the first birds appeared after evolving from a branch of the dinosaur family. Early lizards and mammals appeared, and ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs appeared in the ocean. Next came the Cretaceous period. The Cretaceous period began at the end of the Jurassic period, about 145.5 million years ago, and continued until the beginning of the Paleogene about 65.5 million years ago. During the late Cretaceous, the Earth was on the opposite side of the galaxy from where it is now. The Cretaceous period was a time of warm climate, which led to high sea levels and the creation of numerous inland seas. The Cretaceous period is named after the Latin word creta, which means chalk. In the ocean roamed not extinct reptiles along with ammonites and rudists, on land, dinosaurs were still kings, and Tyrannosaurus, Velociraptor and Triceratops also appeared. Flowering plants also first appeared at this time. The Cretaceous period ended about 65.5 million years ago with the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, which destroyed many groups of dinosaurs as well as pterosaurs and large marine reptiles. It is assumed that this extinction event was caused by the impact of an asteroid about 90 miles in diameter which hit the Earth near the Yucatan Peninsula in present-day Mexico. The emergence of mammals, 
The period between 65 million years ago and the present day is called the Cenozoic. During this time, the Earth's continents took their current positions and the world's flora and fauna evolved into forms that we recognize today. With the dinosaurs gone, omnivores, insectivores and scavengers moved to the background. Semi-aquatic crocodiles and champsosaurs survived the extinction event and thrived. By the end of this period, about 320,000 years ago, Homo sapiens first appeared and had to face frequent glacial periods. The onset of a new galactic year. As Earth begins its next galactic year, the same processes that shaped our planet will continue. Geologists predict that the Pacific Ocean will be submerged under the Eurasian and North American plates and the Atlantic Ocean will expand, bringing the North American and Asian continents closer together. It is assumed that a possible new supercontinent called Amasia will form in about 100 million years. The sun will become much brighter due to aging and this will eventually evaporate Earth's oceans, turning the planet into a hot desert with liquid water only at the poles. Without the lubricating effect of the oceans, plate tectonics will cease. When the sun begins to die in about 5 billion years, it will become a red giant that will either engulf the Earth or strip off the Earth's atmosphere. The mystery of the Templars hidden in plain sight. At the beginning of the 14th century, a wave of terrible events swept across Europe. The powerful spiritual knightly order of the Templars, once the pride and support of the Christian world, was accused of heresy and destroyed. The Grand Masters and Knights were subjected to torture and burned at the stake. It seemed that the legendary order had vanished into thin air. However, according to ancient legends, not all Templars were exterminated. A part of them, those most initiated into the Order's secret knowledge, managed to escape and hide from persecution. Since then, they continue to exist in absolute secrecy, hiding in plain sight. The first hint of this was the mysterious death of the last Grand Master of the Templars, Jacques de Molay, in 1314. Before his execution, he allegedly uttered prophetic words, predicting the demise of King Philip the Fair and Pope Clement V within a year. On March 18, 1314, the people of Paris gathered to witness a grim spectacle the execution of Jacques de Molay, the last Grand Master of the Knights Templar. Accused of heresy, blasphemy and other unspeakable crimes, de Molay was sentenced to be burned alive at the stake. His order had been accused of heresy and destroyed by the command of King Philip IV the Fair. 
Hundreds of Templar knights had been tortured and burned at the stake. The crowd of Parisians watched with a mix of horror and curiosity. De Molay was dressed in a white tunic with the famous Red Cross of the Templars. His gaze was firm and resolute. The executioner read the sentence, accusing the Grand Master of blasphemy and witchcraft. Then he asked if de Molay wished to say anything last. The Templar nodded and spoke loudly, addressing the crowd. King Philip and Pope Clement V have caused great injustice to the Order of the Templars. They have taken our wealth, spilled innocent blood and desecrated our ideals. But I swear that within a year, both will stand before the Supreme Judge for their misdeeds. The executioner grimaced and swung to strike de Molay, but he continued undeterred. These are not just words. This is the ancient curse of the Templars. The King and the Pope will soon die and the Order will rise again like a phoenix from the ashes. As the flames began to lick at his feet, Jacques de Molay remained defiant, insisting on his innocence and the innocence of his order. With his last breath, he called out to God to witness his suffering and to curse those who had brought about his unjust death. Legend has it that as the fire consumed his body, a strange and unsettling phenomenon occurred. Witnesses reported seeing a ghostly figure rise from the flames, a spectral knight clad in the white mantle of the Templars. The apparition hovered above the pyre for a moment before vanishing into the smoke, leaving the onlookers stunned and terrified. And indeed a year passed. And the incredible happened. King Philip IV and Pope Clement V both died suddenly, one after the other, under mysterious circumstances. Did the curse of the Grand Master of the Templars come true? Or was it just a coincidence? The mystery remains unsolved to this day. According to legend, a part of the Templars, along with their immeasurable wealth, fled on mysterious ships and disappeared into a mysterious sanctuary. It is believed that this could have been the remote Scottish islands, the Swiss Alps, or even North America, where the Templars arrived long before Columbus. Since then, the Order has gone deep underground, becoming one of the most closed and powerful secret organizations in history. Its members preserved ancient relics and artifacts, safeguarded priceless knowledge and secrets passed down from generation to generation. In 2018, a group of climbers traveling through a remote valley in the Swiss Alps stumbled upon the strange ruins of an ancient settlement. Among the ruins, they discovered stone-carved symbols resembling Templar crosses. According to local legends, a group of Templars once hid in these mountains after the destruction of their order in 1307. While exploring the abandoned settlement, the climbers suddenly began to suffer one by one from unexplained bouts of nausea, dizziness and hallucinations. Soon, several people from the group mysteriously disappeared without a trace. Rescuers were sent to search for the missing people, but they were met with an even more ominous discovery. In a deep crevice in the rocks, they found the remains of the missing climbers and nearby, the entrance to a vast underground labyrinth of tunnels and caves. Descending underground, the rescuers stumbled upon skeletons of people in knightly armor, surrounded by ritual symbols and artifacts. It seemed that the Templars had used this place as a refuge. The remaining survivors among the climbers were also found there, and were urgently evacuated. 
However, the most disturbing discovery was the numerous traces of a mysterious black substance seeping from the cracks in the rocks. One theory being that this substance caused the bouts of nausea, dizziness and hallucinations. Local authorities took emergency measures to isolate the area. Throughout the centuries, the Templars operated from the shadows, directing the course of historical events. They were behind many revolutions, wars and coups. Their influence extended to monarchs, politicians, bankers and heads of religious denominations. According to theories, the Templars contributed to the French Revolution, the First and Second World Wars, and the creation of the Federal Reserve System of the USA. Their trace is found in the activities of powerful secret societies like the Illuminati, Freemasons and the Skull and Bones Order at Yale. But most astonishingly, the Order of the Templars is said to exist to this day, continuing to influence global processes. Its members hiding behind the mask of ordinary people occupy key positions in governments, corporations, banks and intelligence services of different countries. Their hallmarks are considered to be certain gestures, symbols, signs which can be discerned with careful observation. The Red Cross of the Templars appears in the most unexpected places, from architecture to popular logos and brands. Many researchers are convinced that modern Templars possess immeasurable wealth accumulated over the centuries. They control global financial flows, determine the fates of states and peoples, subjugating even presidents and monarchs to their will. Rumors persist that legendary artifacts such as the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, the Spear of Destiny and other relics possessing truly mystical power are still kept in the secret residences of the Templars. They are the source of the Order's power. The Templars are surrounded by mysteries and legends about strange rituals, occult practices, contacts with otherworldly forces. They are said to possess abilities such as clairvoyance, immortality and the ability to move through space and time. Despite the fantastical nature, theories about the modern existence of the Templars are not without foundation. They are fueled by numerous finds of artifacts, documents, secret messages, encrypted in historical monuments and works of art. Professor Smithson carefully placed the ancient tome on the table in his office. This book, recently discovered in a secret chamber of an old castle in Scotland, was the clue he had been missing to unravel the greatest mystery of the Templars. Years of research, deciphering hundreds of encrypted messages, studying artifacts and architectural monuments, all this led him to understand that the Order of the Templars did not disappear after its destruction in 1312. Moreover, it continued to exist in the strictest secrecy over the centuries, passing its knowledge from generation to generation. The record spoke of the existence of the greatest relic of the Templars, a certain artifact of incredible power, capable of changing the course of all human history. In 2001, a mysterious tomb with the remains of Templars was discovered in France, containing encrypted messages. And in 2017, archaeologists unearthed a hidden tunnel under the ruins of the Templar fortress in Jerusalem, leading in an unknown direction. Therefore, theories that the Order of the Templars did not disappear but continues to exist in the strictest secrecy, hiding in plain sight, seem quite plausible. Perhaps this enigmatic organization still guards its priceless treasures and knowledge, protecting them from prying eyes. And who knows, maybe one day the Templars will emerge from the shadows and reveal their secrets to the world. Or they will forever remain in the shadows like ghosts watching over humanity and influencing the course of history.
What is the Earth's extinction cycle? In the depths of time, hidden from the eyes of modern man, lies a secret that binds the fates of millions of species on Earth. Did you know that our planet has experienced numerous extinction cycles in its history? These events led to the disappearance of many species shaping the world we know today. The most famous extinction event is the one that killed the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. It was caused by a massive asteroid impact that changed the course of our planet's evolution. But this is not the only extinction event that has occurred. Scientists have identified five major extinction events in Earth's history. The most recent of which was the Permian extinction about 252 million years ago. These events were caused by various factors, such as volcanic eruptions, climate change and asteroid impacts. They paved the way for the emergence of new species that evolved and became dominant on the planet. Studying these extinction cycles is important for a better understanding of our planet's history and preparing for any future events. By learning from the past, we can help protect the diverse forms of life that inhabit Earth. In the distant past, when Earth was young and unspoiled, the forces of nature began their deadly game. Fiery mountains threw their furious emissions, changing the climate and destroying everything in their path. Asteroids like stones from heaven fell to the Earth, leaving destruction and death in their wake. Once in those distant times, dinosaurs ruled the planet. Their huge bodies and mighty claws seemed endless. But even they could not withstand the force of nature. An asteroid huge and relentless struck the earth with such force that the agitated waves of the ocean swallowed the shores. And the earth trembled with horror. Death and destruction enveloped the planet, swallowing ancient inhabitants and leaving only emptiness and silence. But life did not stop. New species, strong and surviving, began to appear, filling the void left by their predecessors. Subsequent extinction cycles came and went, each time leaving their mark on the face of the Earth. But life continued, evolving and adapting to new conditions. Today we stand on the threshold of new challenges, new threats that can change the course of history. But we can learn from the past, prepare for the future, and protect this amazing world we call home.
ghosts of Alcatraz Island, California. Alcatraz Island, with its centuries-old history from ancient Native Americans to Fort Alcatraz and military barracks as well as its service, most often known as one of the harshest federal prisons in the country. Alcatraz, often called a portal to another dimension, is filled with the energy of those who came to the rock and seemingly never left it. Tales and legends about the island have been circulating for several centuries since the time of the first visitors. Initially, Native Americans believed that the island was inhabited by evil spirits. Today, these spirits, which continue to hide in the shadows of the often fog-enshrouded island, have been heard, seen and felt by both staff and many visitors to Alcatraz. It is said that within these historic walls, especially near the dungeon, sounds of male voices, screams, whistles, the clanging of metal doors and terrifying shrieks can be heard. While the island served as a federal prison, several guards reported unusual events, including sounds of wailing and moaning, terrible smells, and a creature that was said to appear with glowing eyes. There were also other reports of ghostly prisoners and soldiers who appeared before the guards and their families living on the island. It is reported that even Warden Johnston who did not believe in ghosts, once heard the sounds of a weeping woman when he was leading several guests on a tour of the prison. According to descriptions, the screams heard by the warden and guests emanated from within the walls of the dungeon. As soon as the weeping stopped, an icy wind swept through the group. Since the 1940s, Ghosts have been observed at the site of the now burned down Warden's house. During a Christmas party at Warden Johnston's house, several guards told a story about a ghostly man who suddenly appeared before them in a grey suit, a cap with a visor and sideburns. When the frightened guards stared at the apparition, the room suddenly became very cold and the fire in the stove went out. Less than a minute later, the spirit disappeared. It was often reported that the old lighthouse would suddenly appear on foggy nights accompanied by a creepy whistling sound and a flashing green light that slowly moved across the island. When the prison was still open, other guards reported hearing phantom cannons and gunshots accompanied by screams that were so real that they sent experienced guards to check thinking that the prisoners had somehow escaped and obtained weapons. Taking cover, the guards cautiously looked around and saw nothing. These incidents were never explained by anyone. Another frequently reported experience by the guards was the smell of smoke, which often came from the deserted laundry room as if something was burning. When they investigated, the black smoke was so thick that the guards had to leave the room. It is said that the infamous D block was and remains the most haunted block in the entire prison. Although initially built like the other prison blocks, the Bureau of Prisons allocated additional funds for a more secure D block after an escape attempt in 1939, in which Arthur Doc Barker was killed. D Block, which became known as the Treatment Unit, consisted of 42 cells with varying degrees of restriction. All prisoners held in D Block had no contact with the population. 36 cells were practically the same as the others, however the inmates were not allowed to work or go to the dining hall for food. They were allowed only one visit to the recreation yard and two showers a week and all food was served in the cells. Their only entertainment was reading materials approved by the prison. All these cells faced the Golden Gate Bridge, from where a cruel cold wind often blew. It is known that one guard working in D Block turned on the air conditioner to make it even colder for those in the block. 
Five of the remaining six cells in D block were known as strip cells, but more often they were called the whole. These cells, intended for the most serious violators of prison rules, were located on the lower tier, the coldest place in the prison, and contained only a sink, toilet and a low-power light bulb that guards could turn off. The inmates' mattresses were taken away during the day. They were never allowed into the yard, the shower, and were not given reading materials. Inmates could be sentenced to 19 days of confinement in the prison, in complete isolation and in a state of constant boredom. A former guard who worked at the prison in the 1940s reported that guards often saw the ghostly presence of a person dressed in 19th century prison clothes walking down the corridor. Once when an inmate was locked in the hole, he immediately began screaming that someone with burning eyes was there with him. The ghostly 19th century inmate became such a joke among the guards that the inmate's screams about the attack were ignored. The inmate's screams continued all night, then suddenly changed to complete silence. When the guards checked the cell the next morning, the inmate was found dead with a terrified expression on his face and noticeable handprints on his throat. An autopsy showed that the strangulation was not self-inflicted. At that time, many believed that the inmate was strangled by a guard who had finally grown tired of the inmate's screams. Although an investigation was conducted, no one confessed. Most believed that the inmate was killed by the restless evil spirit of a 19th century inmate often seen wandering the corridors. Adding to the mystery, when the guards lined up the inmates for the daily count, there were too many in the line. At the end of the row appeared the recently strangled inmate. While everyone, both guards and inmates, watched in stunned silence, the ghostly figure disappeared. Today's visitors and staff often report cold spots in the corridors of D-Block, as well as sudden strong feelings. Cells 12 and 14D are the most active. It is often reported that cell 14D is almost 20 degrees colder than the other cells in the block. And many psychics have felt emotional impressions in the corners of the cells where, as is known, punished inmates suffered. These cells are so eerie that some park rangers refuse to go there alone. When authors Richard Weiner and Nancy Osborne, authors of the book Haunted House, made a trip to Alcatraz, they too felt creepy sensations in cell 14D. When the couple entered the cell with the park ranger, they all felt a strong vibration and tingling in their hands. Convinced that something or someone was with them, Osborne stated that she had never felt so much energy in one place. Michael Corey, co-author of the book Alcatraz with Ghosts, also described receiving psychic impressions when he visited cell 14D. Also experiencing tingling, he tells of how he saw a small man with a shaved head who told him that he had been beaten, had his legs broken and was left in solitary confinement. Another time, when famous ghost hunter Richard Sennett and a psychic spent the night in Alcatraz, Sennett locked himself in cell 12D, where it is said an evil spirit resided. When the steel door closed, the ghost hunter felt icy fingers wrap around his neck. Many believe that the C-block approach where inmates Bernard Coy Joseph Kretzer and Marvin Hubbard were killed during an escape attempt in 1946, is haunted by ghosts. Loud clanging sounds are often heard, which stop when the door opens and resume only after it closes. It is said that the laundry room in C-Block also has an invisible presence. 
when a CBS television news team invited famous psychic Sylvia Brown along with former inmate Leon Thompson. Sylvia immediately encountered an invisible presence and strong impressions of violence in the laundry. When she described a tall man with a bald head and small beady eyes, Leon Thompson, a former inmate, stepped forward and said, I remember the butcher. He was a hitman for Murder Incorporated before they caught him. His name was Abi Maldowitz, but we called him the butcher. Another inmate killed him here in the laundry. Prison records confirmed that Maldowitz was killed by another inmate in the laundry room of C Block. When Al Capone was imprisoned in Alcatraz, he was placed in a cell located in the western part of B Block. Although the gangster was never allowed to have a musical instrument or radio, many reported the sound of a ghostly banjo playing in his cell. In 1992, Alcatraz was featured on the popular television program Sightings, where several National Park Service employees confirmed the grim history of the prison. Among the stories told by the staff were unexplained bangs, running footsteps, unearthly screams, cell doors that mysteriously closed by themselves, moans, the clanking of chains and a constant feeling of being watched. Psychic investigator Peter James shared his impressions while walking through the prison. James reported hearing the voices of people who had gone mad and experienced violence, fear and pain. The stories of ghosts visiting Alcatraz Island have become so frequent that the legends have become as popular as the long history of the island itself. It seems that this prison for paranormal phenomena is destined to live up to its popular nickname, Helcatraz. The year was 1741, and Great Britain and Spain were at war. In May 1741, the British warship HMS Wager set sail as part of Commodore George Anson's squadron, whose mission was to harass and disturb the Spaniards in the Southern Seas. However, fate had a different ordeal in store for the ship and its crew. After several months at sea, HMS Wager became separated from the squadron during a storm near Cape Horn and was wrecked on the inhospitable shores of Patagonia. More than 150 crew members found themselves cast ashore on the rocky coast without provisions or any means of subsistence in this harsh land. Under the ominous light of the full moon, HMS Wager cut through the raging waters of the Strait of Magellan. Fierce winds howled like packs of demons, throwing huge waves onto the deck. But this was no ordinary May night. There was an ominous premonition in the air. Suddenly the ship shuddered, striking the rocks. Captain Charles Raymond desperately tried to steer the vessel into deep water. But it was too late. The wager was stuck on the reef, surrounded by thunderous waves. 
As the hull smashed against the stones, it seemed as if the island itself was emitting inhuman screams. The crew panicked, scrambling to save their lives. Captain Charles Raymond ordered them to land, and they established a camp on a sinister patch of land. In the following days, strange events began to haunt the survivors. At night, eerie screams and moans were heard, which could not be attributed to any earthly creature. The sailors swore they saw pale figures gliding between the rocks. Soon, quarrels and disputes began in the camp due to a lack of supplies. But the worst was ahead. One night, heart-wrenching screams of horror were heard and several sailors disappeared without a trace. All that remained were signs of struggle on the coastal sand. The survivors fell into madness from fear. They were convinced that the island was cursed possessed by evil supernatural forces thirsting for their souls. Some sailors went mad, wandering the shore and muttering terrifying incantations. Many sailors fell ill with scurvy. Soon some of the sick began to die. The ship's captain, Charles Raymond, also died, and he had to be replaced by his deputy, David Cheap. Captain David Cheap, wounded in the wreck, struggled to maintain control over the crew. Many sailors had been forcibly conscripted into the fleet, and now, finding themselves in a desperate situation, they mutinied. They decided to seize the boats and try to reach populated areas on their own. Captain Cheap and the officers loyal to him tried to stop the mutineers, but to no avail. The mutineers captured the boats and headed north along the Chilean coast. However, new hardships and deprivations awaited them. Storms, hunger and thirst plagued them at every turn. Most of them perished on the way, and only a few managed to reach Spanish settlements where imprisonment awaited them. John Bulkley and John Cummins were in despair. Together with other survivors, they fled the cursed island on a captured boat, leaving behind their insane comrades. But their nightmare was far from over. The first days of their journey were excruciating, the scorching sun, scant supplies of water and provisions. But the worst was yet to come. At night, ominous whispers and moans seemed to follow them. The spirits of the island, they won't let us go, one of the sailors cried out in terror. One night, as the boat drifted in the ominous silence, Something huge and dark sliced through the water next to them. The sailors screamed in horror as a giant shadow surrounded their vessel. It's the vengeful spirit of the island. He's come to take our souls, howled one of the madmen, cursing in an unfamiliar language. The next day, two sailors disappeared without a trace. All that was left was splattered blood on the bottom of the boat. The rest were paralyzed with fear, not daring to even speak of what had happened. Days merged into a nightmarish stream of hunger, thirst and madness. One by one, the sailors went mad or died. By the time the boat reached the shores of Chile, only a few people were left alive, including Bulkley and Cummins. Exhausted, driven mad by the horrors they had experienced, the survivors were arrested by the Spaniards. 
John Bulkley played a key role in planning the wager mutiny. He could not have carried it out alone. They secretly planned to raise a mutiny against Cheap, even recording their plans and the reasons for their uprising. Meanwhile, the remaining members of the wager crew on shore faced even more terrifying trials. Among them were the severely wounded and dying who required immediate care. They were forced to subsist on shellfish and seaweed, suffering from scurvy and the cold of the Patagonian winter. A few individuals made a desperate attempt to cross Patagonia and reach the Spanish territories on the other coast of South America. But their tracks soon vanished in the vast expanses and nothing was known of their fate. Of the nearly 250 people aboard the wager, only 36 survived. The rest perished from wounds, hunger, diseases, or fell victim to the elements and hostile natives. The survivors moved around the island in groups, searching for food and shelter. After two weeks, having reached their goal on the other side of the island, they stumbled upon edible fruits, which allowed them to hold on and not die of hunger while waiting for help. But as it turned out, their nightmare was far from over. Lieutenant Benjamin Starr clung to the trunk of a tree, his heart pounding so hard it seemed about to leap from his chest. Around him in the night forest, ominous sounds echoed, screams, howls and the beat of drums. Just a few days ago, there were nearly 150 of them survivors after the shipwreck of the wager off the coast of Patagonia. But their journey in search of safety turned into a nightmare when they encountered a tribe of fierce native cannibals. First, the stragglers who fell behind the group disappeared. Then entire patrols did not return from reconnaissance. Star saw signs of struggle and blood, but no other traces. Then, the nightly nightmares began. Piercing screams and cries tore through the silence, chilling the blood in their veins. Sometimes they found scattered human bones and skulls gnawed to a shine. They're eating us! One of the sailors screamed. Lieutenant Star tried to maintain order, but terror seized his people. Last night, everything reached a climax. The cannibal tribe descended on their camp like a wild horde. Star watched as his comrades fell one by one under the blows of clubs, spears and arrows. The air was filled with screams of agony. Those who survived were captured and bound. One by one, his people fell, their bodies brutally disfigured. When it was all over, the natives gathered their bloody harvest, severed heads and scalps as trophies. Bulkley watched in horror as the natives began their bloody feast. Only a handful managed to flee into the night, including Lieutenant Benjamin Starr. He ran blindly, pursued by ominous howls and the beat of drums. Sounds he would never forget. Finally, he collapsed from exhaustion, his mind barely clinging to reality. Starr knew he had to warn the world about the atrocities of these wild cannibals. For if they are not stopped, their bloody feast may spread further. At night, Star still heard the ominous drums and cries, and before his eyes stood the images of the disfigured bodies of his people. Soon, on the other end of the island, two groups united into one under the leadership of Captain Cheap. The group of Lieutenant Benjamin Star and Captain David Cheap. The survivors clung to life, hoping for a miracle. And it happened. Several months later, 
when another British ship passed by. Among the survivors was John Byron, the grandfather of the poet Lord Byron. John Byron was a midshipman on the ship Wager when the ship was wrecked, and he was one of the few survivors and a witness to all the horrors. The thrilling story of the ship Wager became a public sensation in its time. The first written account by the Honourable John Byron played no small part in this. His grandson Lord Byron would later surpass his ancestor in literary fame. Byron detailed the mutiny of part of the crew and their attempt to escape on the boats. He also condemned the mutineers, calling them cowards and traitors who abandoned their wounded comrades to fate. They returned to England telling the world about the horrors and sufferings that had befallen them. Many were surprised that any of them had survived. Their stories shook society and caused a wide public outcry. The Wager tragedy vividly demonstrated the dangers and challenges faced by sailors of that time in uncharted waters far from their native shores. It also exposed problems related to the staffing of military ship crews, many of whom were recruited from among criminals and outcasts. This forced the Admiralty to reconsider approaches to ensuring the safety and training of military ship crews for long voyages. At the end of 2006, an expedition of the Scientific Society of Explorers, SES, searched for the wreckage of the wager and found a 5 by 5 meter piece of wooden hull with some frames and outer planking in the shallow water at the northwestern corner of Wager Island. Today, the story of the wreck of HMS Wager serves as a reminder of the courage and resilience of sailors of the past, of their readiness to risk their lives in the performance of duty. It teaches us that even in the most hopeless situations, one must not lose hope and humanity, for only unity and mutual assistance help the few surviving crew members to survive this terrible tragedy. The last entries of Captain Cheap in his tattered diary, rescuers found terrifying records of the crew's misfortunes after the shipwreck. Their stories vividly describe the incredible resilience of man and the depths to which people can sink in a state of despair. Cheap's records became a grim reminder of how quickly a civilized person can descend into primitive barbarism when faced with extreme desperation. Jake woke up in a cold sweat, his heart pounding wildly. The dream had been so realistic, so vivid. He saw himself as another person, a soldier on the battlefield during World War II. Explosions, screams, blood everywhere, and then a bullet hit him right in the chest, and everything plunged into darkness. Jake sat up in bed trying to catch his breath. 
It wasn't the first time he had such vivid, unforgettable dreams about past lives. Since early childhood, he had strange memories and skills that seemed to have no explanation. He remembered how at five years old he spoke Italian fluently, although no one in his family knew the language. And at 10, he suddenly displayed a talent for playing the piano as if he had been doing it all his life. His parents were puzzled but chalked it up to giftedness. Now at 30, Jake began to wonder if these dreams were memories of past lives. According to statistics, 70% of people who remembered past lives recalled a violent death. And 9% demonstrated unusual skills related to that life. Jake decided to conduct his own investigation. He turned to Dr. Tucker, a renowned reincarnation researcher. After a series of detailed interviews and tests, Dr. Tucker concluded that Jake's memories seemed authentic. It turned out that in his previous life, Jake was an Italian composer and pianist named Marco Rosso. He died during a bombing in 1944 at the age of 34. Many details from Jake's dreams matched Marco's biography. This discovery was a turning point for Jake. He finally found answers to questions that had plagued him all his life. Belief in reincarnation, which once seemed strange to him, now became his reality. Jake decided to dedicate his life to further study of this mysterious concept. Indeed, research shows that more and more people believe in reincarnation. But more importantly for Jake was that he was able to uncover the mystery of his soul and connect two lives, the current and the past. He dedicated himself to helping other people suffering from unexplained memories and dreams, helping them understand their reincarnation story. Jake's research inspired many scientists to continue studying reincarnation. And although many questions remain unanswered, one thing became clear. The human soul can exist forever. Moving from one incarnation to another, carrying with it the experience and knowledge of past lives. And who knows what amazing secrets of past lives may yet be revealed. The events of the year 536 AD, when the sun disappeared and a global catastrophe occurred, entered history as the year without a summer. Chronicles of many peoples testify to strange and terrifying phenomena that occurred that year.
the sun seemed to dim. The sky was covered with dark clouds, and cold and drought continued for almost two years. Scientists could not explain the reasons for these events for a long time. However, the study of geological data and the analysis of ancient texts allowed them to recreate the picture of a global natural disaster. It all started in the spring of 536. A powerful eruption somewhere in the tropical region released a colossal amount of volcanic ash and smoke into the atmosphere. This ash blocked the sunlight for many months across the planet. The temperature dropped sharply. In Europe and Asia, abnormal colds devastating for the harvest set in. The summer of 536 was so frosty and dry that all crops died. A terrible famine began. People died from exhaustion and diseases. Barbarian tribes went to war against weakened empires in search of food and loot. Chaos and violence flourished. The volcanic winter lasted almost two years. Only in 538 did the sun begin to break through the clouds of ash and smoke. But the consequences were terrifying. Hunger and epidemics led to the death of millions of people. Entire regions were depopulated. Many tribes and peoples disappeared in the darkness of this disaster. Great empires trembled and began to disintegrate. This was the beginning of the Dark Ages in Europe. A period of decline and regression that lasted for centuries. The consequences were catastrophic. Powerful states collapsed, entire peoples disappeared. The Dark Ages began in Europe. A period of decline and regression that lasted for centuries. Only many years later, analyzing chronicles and geological data, scientists were able to recreate the picture of the events of 536. The name of the volcano responsible for the global cooling event in 536 AD is not definitively known. However, the Ilopango volcano in El Salvador is one of the leading candidates. A massive eruption from Ilopango is believed to have triggered the climatic cooling of that year. Other sources have suggested Krakatoa as a possible location, but this is less certain. The exact source of the volcanic winter remains a topic of ongoing research and debate among scientists. The year 536 AD was indeed a remarkable and catastrophic period in history. Here are some intriguing details about the events that unfolded. Mysterious fog. A mysterious fog enveloped Europe, the Middle East and parts of Asia for 18 months, causing the sun to appear dimmed and leading to a significant drop in temperatures. Volcanic eruptions. The climatic cooling, known as the volcanic winter of 536, was likely caused by at least three simultaneous volcanic eruptions. The exact locations of these eruptions are still uncertain, with various continents being proposed as possible sources. Global impact. The ash from the eruptions blocked sunlight, leading to a dramatic decrease in temperature. This resulted in widespread crop failures, famine and social turmoil across the planet. Historical accounts, Byzantine historian Procopius wrote about the sun giving off light without brightness akin to an eclipse and described a year where men were free neither from war nor pestilence nor any other thing leading to death. Climatic aftermath. The immediate effects of the volcanic winter were compounded by subsequent eruptions in 540 and 547, which further extended the period of global cooling. The Late Antique Little Ice Age 
This period of climatic cooling lasted from 536 to around 560 AD, marking the beginning of one of the worst periods to be alive, if not the worst year, according to medieval scholar Michael McCormick. These events had profound and lasting impacts on human civilization, contributing to the onset of the Dark Ages in Europe a time characterized by decline and regression. The year 536 AD and its aftermath remain a subject of fascination and study among historians and scientists today. And today, scientists continue to argue about what exactly happened in 5E36. And the volcanic winter of 536 forever entered history as one of the greatest natural disasters that changed the course of human civilization. But it is still not possible to accurately determine the place and scale of this ancient natural disaster. And the mysterious volcanic winter still holds many puzzles.